Howdy, everyone. We are here, finally bringing this uh, trilogy of Star Wars commentaries to a close. With um, the only one of these movies that I wouldn't necessarily call divisive, just because I think the majority of people dislike this one. And uh, oh boy, um, Rise of Skywalker, we're going to have a lot to say about it. As per usual, if you feel like watching this movie along with the commentary, then uh, you can find this film on Disney+. Plus. It just arrived there a couple of days ago. And uh, you can get the movie to timestamp zero. And when I say now, we will all collectively unpause. So, uh, yeah, I, I kind of just want to dive right into this one. So without any further ado, then you can all unpause in three, two, one, now. So yeah, I just now, like last night or the night before, rewatched this movie for the third time, and uh, it was Eden's first time viewing it. It was my mom's first time viewing it, and uh, they came out of it liking it more than I do. So I'm happy for them on that front. But uh, I don't know. As per our usual mo, how about you lay it on us? How you felt about this one coming out of the theater for the first time? Well, coming out of the theater, I thought, like, I was already expecting this movie to be great. Um, and it more or less met my expectations, only it insulted my intelligence a little more. <laughs> um, honestly, I actually, this this is an enjoyable dumpster fire. Um, it's It's not... Like in a way, this movie is fairly fun to watch. It's it's a fun throwaway, really bad story, um, Star Wars movie. Um, it's it's much more tolerable than any of the prequels. Um, if I had to force myself to watch one of the worst Star Wars movies, I would watch this before watching any of the prequels. Having said that, um, yeah, this movie is awful. <laughs> It's it's not um, a drab like BBS. Like this movie is genuinely in parts fairly decent and fun to watch. Um, but if you're at all here for the story and you've built up any investment in any of these characters, this fails in almost every single way imaginable. Um, yeah, the way taking the thinking about it is because. I'm I'm really torn on how I view this movie relative to the pre because you're right. This movie has the word I'll use for it is charm, especially in the first half. It has an undeniable charm to a lot of it that I think is like JJ came back to direct this one. I think that's in just every movie he's made, even the really bad ones. He how good his movies are, I, I, I think, is entirely dependent on the writers he's working with. Uh, to talk about this scene real quick, before we get too far away from it, um, him fighting all these people, pretty cool action scene, even though it's partially in slow-mo. But uh, who are they? Why are they protecting that? Are they even Read involved the with this? Read uh, the okay, because we, we know that J.J. is not interested in any decent world building, so it's like, who cares? They're... They're people, and he's just he's killing them. Yeah, no. This movie is the one because a lot of people going into this movie had the question on their mind of, like, what is J.J. going to bring to this? Because we've never really seen him end a story before. The only story that J.J. started that he was ever actually tasked with ending was this, uh, was this sort of teen drama that he used to work on. And it's it's really unfortunate that the end result was he's just not a guy who can end things and that's why he doesn't do it or at least that's what you would assume coming out of this movie i'm like yeah the common denominator of this movie it's basically all retread and nostalgia it's i don't have my own real original idea so i mean this feels like uh, Star Wars fan fiction that the studio was just forced to make 
Yeah, like, like my like joke has one been of the people like you remember the uh, that Harley Quinn episode with the fourth wall guy and the guy with the last Jedi shirt. Yep, it's like, like that guy wrote the script for this movie. Yeah, and then they're like, "Great, this is the movie we're gonna make." And like, you would expect that the people who feel that way about Last Jedi were really pleased with Force Awakens. I don't think anyone who liked Force Awakens or Last Jedi was pleased with this movie. And like, obviously, I'm being facetious and I'm exaggerating. I do actually personally know quite a few people who enjoy this movie, but on the whole, I feel like it's really disrespectful to both of its predecessors, which is weird because JJ's back. And so my joke has been like, we don't have a Star Wars sequel trilogy. We have a really good Star Wars sequel duology followed by a multi-million dollar fanfic. But like um, the way the way that I would describe it is this kind of puts a magnifying glass on JJ as a filmmaker and to a variable degree Chris Terrio as a writer. But for JJ specifically, this movie has all of the charm and all of the sort of fun, shallow, popcorn-like adventure feel that even his worst movies have. But I think it's his worst movie, I think. And like you brought up the prequels. I think this movie is easily a worse story than any of the prequels, barring maybe Attack of the Clones. Attack of the Clones has a really, really bad story. But like, take away the fact that this movie has more charismatic acting, has better visual direction, I feel, has better CG, has a generally better pace to it, has a clear protagonist uh, parts of the prequels. I just, I think this is a worse told story than the prequels. Again, maybe excluding Attack of the Clones. Um... I don't know. A lot of the prequels are a slog to get through for me. And They're a slog. Uh, this one is more compelling because, again, it has that J.J. Abrams charm and it has actors who are, you know, charismatic, which is something the prequels don't have. But I don't know, just on the nuts and bolts of, like, pure narrative decision-making, I think almost everything about this movie is hot garbage. And uh, we talked over Palpatine's whole introduction. This, from that scene in the theater, I was like, okay, yeah, it is very clear. <laughs> the word go. JJ did not have a real original thought in his mind when approaching this movie. We are just going to straight up rehash. And this is just Star Wars greatest hits with none of the substance behind what made any of the original moments compelling. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the only reason that Palpatine is the villain of this movie is because we just want to keep rehashing original trilogy. Um, yeah, and it, it makes no sense at all for Palpatine to be the villain of this movie and for us to act like this was the logical progression of the past two movies when he wasn't there at all. Exactly. And part of that is like in some roundabout way, we can blame the you for this happening, I think, because Disney like went full tilt on marketing this as the end of the Skywalker saga. And like even around the time of Last Jedi coming out, the Skywalker saga in quotes of like this being really a nine movie package, that idea starts with the marketing for this film. Where it's like implicitly we're like, yeah, this is a sequel to a trilogy of movies that have prequels, and it is all one continuous narrative, but- It's there not was about the Skywalkers though, like- Yeah, no, there was never any sense coming out of The Force Awakens or The Last Jedi that like, we are, we are trying to co coalesce these movies and the prequels and the original trilogy into one long nine movie story. And, and what's really awkward about that is, so th this also goes with the really stupid title of this movie. So Ray more or less adopts herself into the family, even though everyone who actually is a Skywalker is dead at this point. Luke is dead. 
Um, Leia dies in this movie. Um, Han, I mean, he never actually married Leia, but for all intents and purposes, you know, he was he was part of the family. He's dead. Um, and their force ghost just look on it as like, yeah, it's okay, you can use our name, even though we're all dead. And like, it, it just plays is so awkward and goofy. And I feel like it would play awkward even if that wasn't the case. Like, not as much, obviously, but my, but like... Especially because while Leia and Luke serve as mentors, they don't ultimately fix um, Ray's I don't have a, a mommy and daddy complex. Um, yeah. But, like, even on a more shallow note than that, Luke is the only one of them who's actually a Skywalker. Like, Leia doesn't go by Skywalker. Han and Ben are solos. Anakin Skywalker is a non-factor in this movie on any level. There is one Skywalker in this movie, and, like, we'll talk about Luke's role when we get to it, but this movie is not about him at all. No. The only reason he's brought back is so, again, we can, you know... Poke at your nostalgia with the scene from Empire Strikes Back with Yoda lifting the, the, the fighter. Yeah, and just, I don't know, the thing about Palpatine is, again, and with the fact that he hasn't appeared in either of the previous movies, like, what you've inadvertently done by making it so that Snoke was controlled by Palpatine and Palpatine was manipulating Kylo Ren from the very beginning is you've taken what was meant to be the Skywalker saga and you've turned it into the Palpatine saga. And especially when we get to the thing with Rey and making her a Palpatine, it's just, it's so weird to me that you're saying that this saga has always been about the Skywalkers versus the Palpatines. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's on so many levels that doesn't work. It's, uh, I don't know, I'm going to have to take that in chunks because, like, almost all of this movie's problems start with bringing Palpatine in. That, from the word go, that was a mistake. It was a mistake. We, sh we should have um, developed Kylo more and just made him a villain instead of trying to do the stupid redemption arc with him again. And yeah. it's ten times worse than I could have ever imagined it. It's, it's just not a dime and out of nowhere. Like, and, and I don't buy from the conversation that he has with an hallucination of his dad, not even really his dad, um, that that gets him to turn. Like, it's so goofy. Um, yeah. And like, I we're, we're talking over Ray's uh, training sequence here. Um, it's interesting because there's not a lot of this, or there's almost none of this in um, the first movie, Your Last Jedi. Yeah. She doesn't do this in the first two movies. She's holding um, she's holding the uh, lightsaber downward like Ahsoka. Huh. Yeah, you're uh, right. I don't know if you noticed that. That's that's all over her fight choreography in this movie. She holds that, it downward. That's interesting. That said, we know the only reason that we have her training here is because of the constant complaints of like, why isn't she trained? Why doesn't she, how is she fighting so well without training, even though she really does not fight well prior to this movie, but that's a whole different thing. Uh, she fights decently enough. She holds her own against those, uh, not Imperials, but- um, The Praetorian Guard, yeah. Yeah. Like, she takes out a couple of those guys, yeah, but you can tell in the She's not a train fighter, she's struggling, yeah, like, that definitely comes across. Yeah. And, I don't know, like we said, we're going to have a lot to talk about, so we should probably just broach it now. How do we feel about the choice to handle Leia and Carrie Fisher the way that we do? Because I was kind of for it, going, leading up to this movie, and on my first watch, it didn't really bug me a whole bunch. Outside of the way that we get rid of her, which, you know, rock in a hard place. It's but awful, more, but I get it. The more I think about it, the more doing this feels kind of gross to me. Uh, I mean, do you think they should have forced some way for her to die? I mean, fans, I feel like fans would have rioted regardless. Um, they would have. But, but I, like, forcing some way for her to die off screen. And, like, we have to consider, like, how much of this movie being as iffy as it is, is like they really planned for her to be a major role in this film 
before she died, and then that might have thrown whatever story they had planned completely out of whack. But I don't know. I really feel like for as little as she is in this and for the role that she has, I don't think it's significant or meaningful or well executed enough to justify literally trying to animate a dead person into a movie. It, it feels wrong to me. And what's really weird is, because we talked over the interaction that she just had with Leia, um, she calls her master, and I'm like, yeah, that's that's really weird and dumb, because this movie retcons her even having any Jedi training in the first place. Um, yeah. She, wasn't, she was not a Jedi. Um, as far as we know, she's never even actually ignited and like had to fight anyone from the First Order with a lightsaber before. Um, that's just, that's not her role. Um, she's Especially since sensitive. all implication is the First Order showed up fairly recently and she would have already been an old woman. Well, there's that and the fact that canonically, as far as, far as these movies are concerned, screw any, you know, incendiary media that I'm not reading because these movies should... I mean, I say these movies should stand on their own, and to a degree, that's true. We do have stuff that expands the universe, like the Thrawn trilogy and the books, and I'm, I'm aware of all that stuff. What I'm saying is, if something's canonical and it's at all important or relevant to the story that you're telling in the films, you should make it apparent. And if, as far as the films go, she's never used a lightsaber against um, the people that they're fighting, she's not actually a trained Jedi, why is she training Rey? Just because we don't have another actual living Jedi we can use, and we killed Luke in the last film. But uh, Malik, you see, the thing is, somehow Palpatine returned. <laughs> oh, I hate, I hate this too. When uh, he's like, somehow Palpatine returned, and everyone's like, oh no, like they actually. No one, no one here should have any conception of what that means exactly but they, they either read the script or they somehow know everything that they shouldn't know from the previous movies like especially using the name palpatine and it's like we call him palpatine or we call him darth sidious sidious got a name drop in the last jedi and you would figure that after long enough luke would like recognize him by that Part of the problem of not bringing him up in the previous two movies is that whether that's what you meant to do or not, alongside the rest of the world building, you've created a world where all of the contemporaries, Ray and Poe and Finn and like people around their age, shouldn't like like again, if we think Luke Skywalker is a legend on Jakku because it's like a backwater nowhere planet, like how many people around the universe, do we really expect to, like, recognize the Emperor by name? Especially when we have a whole different thing in their place, which is the Order, and... Conceivably, yeah. how many people even know that Palpatine was a thing? Because even in the original trilogy, um, the Emperor is not a public knowledge yeah it's, no yeah it's mostly just the rebellion that knows about him because um they're fighting his forces um darth like, vader is his face he's the yeah, guy darth vader is the face. yeah and uh like i know this this is like a big thing for you i don't really care i don't, I don't even it bothers me less in terms of, like, I just like Rose and wish she was around more. That's true. I do. But it also bothers me on the level of, like, J.J. Abrams came out of The Last Jedi in interviews saying, like, Ryan made a lot of choices with that movie. The one that I liked the most was his hiring of Kelly Marie Tran. It's like, I feel so sorry for her as an actress having to go through all of the crap that she did for The Last Jedi that like whether you like her character or not, what she went through was not okay and it was ridiculous and it was not warranted by anything in that movie. And then like for whatever the motivation was, they give her like less than two minutes total screen time in this film. That, I'm sorry, that bothers me. Uh, no, it doesn't, doesn't really affect me at all. I, I get that like all, all the people who were hating on her just for 
being Asian and not having a ton of acting experience, yeah, those people can go F off. But um, if you didn't like your character, you didn't like your character. I understand, um, I don't know, feeling bad for her, but I don't think it's an issue for this movie at all that she is not a presence. You've already got a ton of characters to service. And, and it services none of them. Exactly. <laughs> that is a major problem. See, we um, talked about like the character writing. That's my thing with this movie. It genuinely astonishes me that not a single character in here gets out unscathed. Oh, and by the way, here are the Knights of Ren. Man, um, they're back. <laughs> before, I mean, they were never really here in the first place. Um, they get a flashback in Force Awakens. They're not in Last Jedi at all. Um, they're in a lot of, you know, incendiary media like, you know, comics and stuff. But um, as far as these movies are concerned, this is their first time actually showing up. And they're standing behind Kylo in that scene. And then they're going to show up in the desert scene and just stand on some rocks and do nothing. It's like, you know, hey, great showcase. And it's like, that's that's another thing where the word I've been looking for is like obligatory, where so many complaints were like, oh, why would you set up the Knights of Ren and The Force Awakens or if they weren't going to do anything in that movie or Last Jedi? It's like, rather than just accept that maybe that's a bit of world building and like these guys used to be around and that's a whole thing that we could get into, but we won't. Like you force them into this movie where they then do nothing. And it's just a lot of obligatory stuff put in there to address complaints, but not actually do anything. Yeah, this is reactionary fan complaints and fan film the movie. Ugh. It is what's weird about it. And this is one of the first movies that I've seen like that. Uh, Cause you think back to, to, uh, to BVS and then later Justice League. Um, BVS was a blatant, I don't care. This is what our Superman is. He is monosyllabic and he doesn't talk at all. And he's not the Boy Scout, even though we're pretending that he is. And mm -hmm. you're going to like it. And this is Batman and he's murdering people, even though I'm not, I'm acting like he's not murdering people in scenes where he's murdering people. And then this movie, it addresses a lot of the complaints people had, but it is like, it's so apologetic and yet um, completely unaware of the fact that it's not telling a story at all. I mean, it's telling a bare bones story. They have to go to a place and get a thing to find the thing to stop the emperor. Oh God, the plot mechanics of this movie are ridiculous. This movie could be an hour and a half, if not shorter, just with the number of things that happen in it that actually matter for the plot. Like, we're going to have a whole bunch of plot developments across this movie that exists solely to pad out the screen time and make it so that our characters are doing things on screen but not actually accomplishing anything meaningful. So, like, here we're going to find the knife that will let us find the thing, that will let us find the wayfinder, that will let us find Exegol. We're going to get Chewie taken away so that we don't... Like, nothing really that couldn't have happened with Chewie still around is accomplished by him getting kidnapped. It's just, we've got to spend a couple of minutes rescuing Chewie. We've got to find a way to like shut down C-3PO so that he can read the knife. There's really no reason that we had to do that aside from padding out time. This, this chunk of the movie is the part that I'm actually having fun with because I meant yeah. to say this earlier where it's like, you, you like you're able to have fun with most of this movie and it's like a, a dumb bad movie like dismissible kind of thing yeah. i have that with the first half mm -hmm. like everything up to the palpatine reveal i'm like this doesn't actually work and especially in retrospect it's a really poorly plotted but kind of meaningless fluff but it's a fun adventure movie like turn your brain off yeah at a certain point this movie starts to make me mad and like, I feel really disrespected by it. And I just, it, mm, it, it genuinely like does it's not. It's so unfortunate because I've seen the behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of hard work and care put into this scene and all these extras and the aliens and yep. like in terms of like the actual, just, you know, bare bones filmmaking and not you know, actual story stuff. This is a solid movie. Like it's very well made. Um, but the, like on the page, it's just awful. Yeah. 
Although I do remember that, like, thinking that this was an interesting development the first time. Like, extending their force bond beyond just being able to communicate and into, like, they can interact with each other physically. Oh, I, I view it as, oh, um, JJ was like, oh, Ryan Johnson gave me this really convenient plot device I can use in my movie. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's totally what it is. Yeah, because at the very end of Last Jedi, as we discussed, when she closes the door on the Falcon, and this is the last time they see each other, I always got the impression that she's not going to let him do that again. Uh -huh. They're not going to. She's closed off that connection. Yeah, she will not keep doing that. Yeah, no. A lot, a lot comes from how we handle Kylo in this movie, and how pretty much all of it is bad. But I think. A big part of that is their relationship and how the dynamics of their relationship are completely not what I think any sane person would have coming off of The Last Jedi. Um, uh, I don't want to get into the whole shipping thing, but regardless oh. of whether, whether you think um, Kylo Ren and Rey actually make sense together in a relationship romantically or not... Um, for this movie, I we don't have any real organic legwork to get them to that place. And so the kiss is dumb. Um, well, then, now that you mention it, like I'll, I'll complain about it when we get to the kiss insofar as that's part of this movie being really eager to forgive Kylo Ren for stuff I don't think he's earned and like his redemption quote unquote and why that doesn't work but just in general you're right thinking on it the two of them don't have a ton of scenes together in this movie and the scenes that they do have together with maybe one exception we they don't have what they had in the last jedi where that movie no. whether it was being explicitly romantic or not plays on kind of the sexual tension and chemistry that those actors inherently have and lets that inform the relationship, that's not really in their scenes together in this movie. No, we just pretend that it is so we can have this really stupid, like, fangirl pandering scene at the end. Yeah. And Lando's no, I don't even approach that subject. There was, there was someone in our Civil War commentary who had an issue with us discussing fangirl culture, so I'm not even going to touch that part of it. Okay, that's and that's fine. Lando's just here for for more nostalgia, um, especially because his whole thing about he and Luke were tracking this guy and I when exactly because the time frame doesn't seem to match up with when he was training Ren and then that whole thing happened with them and he left and cut himself off from the fort. So yeah, he ran it, He was just randomly doing these missions with Lando in the middle of nowhere. Like, it, it's just a really throwaway line to justify um, having him even in this movie at all. But see, it's not even that. It's worse than you're making it sound because it's not just a throwaway line. It's sort of like the impetus for going on this journey. Ray's looking through the books and is like, Luke was tracking this thing. And then somewhere along the lines, he just stopped. And... This movie is such a hodgepodge, we're going to be bouncing all over the place. I wanted to save this for when we actually got to Luke, but someone made a really good point, which is that like people complain about The Last Jedi and how it's like Luke would never give up, he's not a quitter, I'm like fine, whatever. That movie justifies it. But this movie basically says Luke knew or at least thought that the Sith were still out there and like doing some shady stuff. And then he started looking for clues and then just stopped for no reason. Yep. Just just gave up. And like also, is the implication of Lando still being here that he like hasn't left? That like he and Luke come here looking for clues about Sith stuff, and then Lando just decides to stick around for who knows how many years? I think so. Like I said, I I literally just rewatched this movie before we even started the commentary. <laughs> And I can't, and I and I'm not even 100 percent sure about that. There's there's a lot. This just, this movie is really poorly thought out, and like you get the sense that maybe there are things that make sense to JJ and Terrio that they're just not explaining. 
Never underestimate a droid. Yeah. Because the I mean, callbacks. Yeah, callbacks. Okay, and I, I want to talk about this before I forget it, because this is a big problem with this movie for me, which is we talked a little bit in The Last Jedi about how that movie is very much acknowledging, particularly through Finn and his arc, the fact of, like, the war has to stop at some point because it's all one big cycle. The good guys blow up the bad guys, the bad guys blow up the good guys, and it's just never-ending and it's ongoing. And, like, I get it. On some level, as fans, we don't want to accept that because if we let the conflict stop, then that means the IP has to stop at some point, and we, like, naturally resist that because we like Star Wars. But I think Ryan Johnson was making a very mature story choice, and Last Jedi was really mature by Star Wars movie standards by suggesting that, like, this has to stop at some point, and part of that would be in getting all of the characters to recognize the stormtroopers as people. And I think if Finn wasn't going to have any other role in the final part of this trilogy, his role should have been like getting the war to end, like for real time, helping create long lasting peace by realizing that like, as long as stormtroopers are still around and being like manipulated and used as tools of the system, mm -hmm. then there will always be people to take advantage of that, and they're never going to, like, stop. If this movie has Finn be like, all of the other Stormtroopers, they could be like me. They could realize this is wrong. If we get them to stop, then, like, Palpatine and all of the guys in charge, they have nothing to work with. And we have actual long-lasting peace. That would be really impactful, meaningful storytelling. But instead, we've got Finn and all of the characters... Like, woo! Yeah! Kaboom! I just killed a whole bunch of stormtroopers who could have been me at any point. Yeah, so celebrate. And it's all over this movie. It's just, it's really unfortunate and it kind of really disservices Finn as a character to have him just be killing. People who were in his position, left and right, and celebrating it like this. I really didn't need the flashlight joke. I think it's a funny gag. And, like, we've done nothing but crap on this movie so far. Like, the one thing that we both agreed on since the beginning, like, since we both see, uh, seen this for the first time, is that these three have a genuine chemistry. And, like, their dynamic is actually really fun. It and when I'm, Yeah, when I'm enjoying this movie, it's because the three of them are together. And they have a really nice rapport. And I wish that relationship had gotten to exist in a better movie. Oh, God. I could... Okay, so you know what else is part of the problem of the fact that we haven't mentioned Palpatine across the previous two movies? It's that we haven't mentioned the Sith hardly at all across the previous two movies. Well, because it's weird because the Sith are a non-entity. Um, yeah. They, they're never brought up. We're not even call, calling Kylo Ren a Sith. Because he's not. Like, he is not one. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting progression of, in the prequels, the Sith are not really all over the place, but their presence is felt, like, really hard through Palpatine and whoever his apprentices are. In the original trilogy, really, it's just Palpatine and Vader. They are the two Sith, and they are in charge, but the Empire isn't really a Sith thing. It's an Empire thing. And then we get to these movies, and the First Order is very much aping the Empire without any of the Sith influence. They're just like, what the Empire had going was great. Like, I don't even know what a Sith is. Who cares? Let's do, like, the whole totalitarian takeover thing. To bring in all of these mentions of, like, Sith and Sith loyalists and Palpatine and stuff, it's like, it's it's bringing back, and, and you know what it is that makes it really weird? Because we talked about The Force Awakens and how between The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, The Last Jedi is weirdly the movie that 
is most sort of reverent and like respectful and acknowledging the prequels. With The Force Awakens, J.J. was very clearly like, let's distance ourselves from the prequels hard. And then in this movie, just by virtue of bringing Palpatine back, it's taking a lot of cues from the prequels. Because even in the original trilogy, in A New Hope and uh, Empire and Return of the Jedi, like Palpatine doesn't become a character until near the end of Return of the Jedi. He's really not a presence in the original trilogy the way that he is the capital B bad guy pulling all the strings in the prequels. This movie is doing that, and it really doesn't work. And uh, for the first time ever, Force users can just heal in Star Wars now. I will see, not for the first time, because we uh, Disney was very smart in uh, releasing the episode of The Mandalorian where Baby Yoda does this before this movie comes out, so people can't make that complaint. Of course. Which, you know, you know, I've, I've made my stance on this clear at this point. I really don't care about the abilities of Force users. My problem with this is that this is a setup for something that's going to pay off, like when she stabs Kylo Ren and brings him back. Oh, that's, I hate that so much. I don't, I don't think that was, the, like, that wasn't a necessary enough story beat to justify this. Um, well, I mean, this doesn't even take up that much screen time, but m my main issue with it is just we, we set this up so we can do a death fake out. Yeah. And, like, the one thing I'll say I like about that scene is, like, this movie is really good. The one thing that it does uh, justice for Ray characterization-wise is that she really does just feel like a genuinely nice person and not in a way that's like forced, just like haha forced. Just like I understand why people like her because she's just a really selfless heroic person. And on paper, that would be interesting for the movie where she finds out that she's related to the bad guys and maybe has, I don't know what genetic evil or something, but this movie really doesn't handle it well. But also the problem with where we take that healing thing later is she healed a physical wound on that snake. Later she's going to heal a physical wound on Kylo. And then when we do her death fake out, we don't even know what killed her. Like, she has no wound. Like, the, the payoff doesn't even match the rules of the setup. Uh, I suppose I like this set. We're about to get to the scene that... Actually, there's there's a lot of scenes I dis dislike. <laughs> I know. Just... Like, it's been so weird. Like, for a couple of times now, you've been like, the thing that I dislike. This move, like, nothing in this movie works. Like, everything almost is a thing to dislike. Story-wise, at least. This was, this is a really solid, really intense scene. Her, her walking up, um, letting the scene build, her igniting the lightsaber, mm -hmm. her doing the flip. That's all really cool. I'm liking the scene okay until we, I'm just going to wait till we freaking get to it, but <laughs> my God. <laughs> But yeah, no, I like that this scene has a sense of patience to it. It's so weird coming from a J.J. Abrams movie that like he lets this play out the way that it does. It's it's like um it's a real like it's tense, but also it's not at all frenetic, which is usually the only way J.J. Abrams knows how to do tension. And this is how it's it's kind of hilarious. The fact that Finn goes over and we just see Chewie and they just captured him off screen. Like, that's not supposed to be funny, but it is. We also and, should have yeah. brought the mask back. We talked about that before, but the mask should have 
stayed off. Yeah. Like, I, ju- I don't understand why he fixed it. Even in the context of this movie being what it is, why Especially did he Especially because it? he keeps taking it on and off. Like, he doesn't just have it for the rest of the movie after he finally puts it back together. There are multiple scenes where he's just not wearing it. Yeah, and it's not like, and it's not like, oh, they broke his mask was a complaint people had about The Last Jedi. Did JJ just really, really like the mask aesthetically? Is this is that what it was? But even if that's true, then why would you have him have it off for multiple scenes in the movie? And just like, I guess we're assuming there are certain points where we just we need him to emote, so we we can't have a, a helmet on him the entire time but we were never afraid of that with vader um and i don't know it's just it's weird yeah and like that really highlights like not to be too insulting to jj because again he's been a part of things i like but him versus ryan like ryan is a guy who thinks of things in terms of like meaningful story choices and when he destroys that mask in the elevator. It's a very loaded moment. And the fact that it stays destroyed and like he's not obscuring his face for the rest of that film says a lot about what that movie is trying to say and him as a character. And I really just have to assume that we're right and that JJ brought it back just because he thought it looked cool. Because what other reason does he have to bring it back? And if he's not gonna have it on for an extended period of the movie. Like, sometimes he has it in scenes, and sometimes he doesn't. Mm-hmm. He's holding it in his hand right now. I don't think we need to be seeing his face during this scene. We have to show that he's concentrating. <laughs> now, that was really shocking and visceral, and I thought, oh, my God, we actually killed Chewie. And we yeah. had one of our, we had our main hero. Kill Chewie. Mm-hmm. Never would have thought. And uh, yeah, we we immediately go back on this because we have no spine. It's terrible. And like, you're not exaggerating when you say immediately. We are going to end this scene, have one scene of dialogue, and then after that, we will find out that he's alive. They couldn't even leave it for five full minutes of screen time. Oh, and that that was also a really stupid way to to end that scene. He he was told to kill Ray. As far as we know, his mission is to kill Rey, and yeah. he just stands there and watches her leave. And we're going to do this thing later where it's like, oh, I didn't want you dead. Palpatine, Palpatine's plan is going to change like five times over the course of this movie with no explanation. Did no one think this through or read over the script? And it's so weird because Palpatine's very presence in this movie destroys so much of it. The, the capital, like first bullet point problem with this movie from conception is bringing Palpatine back. And it's so weird that like they would ruin this movie by bringing him back pretty much and then hardly use him. He's not in this movie for hardly any of it until a climax. He's in like two scenes. I think we should have planned out a new story. We should have had a writer's room. We should have planned out a new story, like what they're doing with these, this new series of books that's what should have been done for these movies but like and like i don't I mean to keep fighting you on that because new i, I don't mean to keep fighting you on that i'm oh, sorry and I, I hate this yeah this, um, i hate this guy i hate him the general pride played by uh, uh richard e grant he's like one of five characters that this movie brings in here who just should not exist who serve no purpose and are yeah, doing things that enough, other characters could easily do. There was enough interest. There was enough of an interesting dynamic that we talked about in Last Jedi, with uh, Hux being the kind of star scream mm-hmm. to uh, to Kylo Ren's Megatron. Yeah, and we could have built upon that further and actually done some cool stuff with that. But no, we we bring in someone to put over Hux, so then we can have Hux be the mole, and it can be this reveal that no one's invested in but okay and then we'll just kill him and it's just it's so unsatisfying and dumb hmm and it's just okay so before we get too far away from it i was wrong it wasn't even less than five minutes that was less than two maybe less than two and a half total minutes of screen time between we think 
Chewie's dead and we find out Chewie's alive. Chewie like explodes, quote unquote explodes at like 41 minutes, 15 seconds. It's minute 42, 40 something when that door opens and he's alive. That's ludicrous. Well, I mean, you know how I feel about death fake outs. We shouldn't, they should never really come up in your, in your story anyway. Yeah, they, they shouldn't, but if they do, at least have the like decency of a 90s 2D animated Disney movie to be like 15, 20 solid minutes of the character off screen. At least have that much of a spine. Keep your audience in suspense for like five seconds. And here we've got another one of the characters I was just talking about. This droid doesn't really need to be in this movie at all. Don't understand why he's here, aside from toys. Uh, you could make that argument for a number of the droids in this franchise. But, like, is there, I mean, aside from, I guess, maybe better mobility, is there really any reason to have BP-8, I mean, BB-8 here versus uh, R2? Uh, not necessarily, but I mean, like, if you're gonna have a new droid, then at least have them be, like, serve a purpose. So, like, yeah, you could argue, why make a new droid if you already have R2? But fine, we've decided that we're gonna make BB-8. Force Awakens practically hinges on BB-8 for a lot of it. And even in Last Jedi, like, he's doing cool stuff. Here's this new thing that really just rolls around and is cute and contributes one plot point that really doesn't actually help anything. And it's like, why? Why is it here? It's the same thing with Richard E. Grant and uh, Dominic Monaghan, who uh, may have already popped up in this movie. But like, why are, the, why are we introducing a bunch of like bit characters in this movie who contribute nothing and yet have a bizarrely large amount of screen time? Um, and we're going to introduce in like an old flame of Poe here in a minute. And I hate that we don't do really anything with her either. Um, like out of all of them, she contributes the most because she and Poe have like something approaching a meaningful conversation, but it's still not much. Yeah, it's, it's still not enough. Um, I saw, I saw her on the poster and she was wielding. She had two of those cool, cool looking like Western science fiction file uh, kind of looking guns mm -hmm. on the poster and i was like who's this character and then i get her in the movie and like the actor's giving a lot of charisma with just her voice but she's she's not in this movie enough and she doesn't get enough to do yeah if you're gonna put a new character into your third movie like they need to be significant um especially because we're not even giving like our our prime, you know, A team character is enough. Like Ray, we we do the Palpatine thing with her, um, which is awful. Yeah. We give her yeah. the I I think I killed Chewie thing, which is awful because it didn't even actually happen. Um and and with Finn, we don't have him be the reason that uh the uh, troopers turn against the order. Like it's we don't do really any solid interesting character stuff with any yeah no the best we get is little tiny self-contained moments like this like, not that you care but i think you're okay yeah and she's like i care and helps her up it's like that's a sweet little moment like clearly someone working on this movie gets and cares about these characters enough to give them little bits and pieces like that but not enough to actually like give them meaningful long-term things to do and so even the characters who the movie is treating best get shafted and here's our knights of ren cameo again you know yeah, not like walking that. around doing absolutely nothing literally like nothing happens the fact that they're on this planet contributes nothing like you would expect that to be oh man there's an element of tension now because those guys are there what if they find our good guys? Nope, they never find them. They never cross paths. They're just set dressing. They don't yep. do anything. And that one, uh, that one robot that uh, they just walked past uh, to get in the door with, like the robot body and the flesh head, reminds me of um, Doctor 
Entropy, I think, from Crash Bandicoot. Babu Frick is voiced by a Moaning Myrtle, and that's funny. I feel bad that I don't remember that actress's name because I've looked it up several times. We have our next uh, fake out coming up here in a minute, and uh, yeah. I hate this too. Um, Cause it's it's just, I mean, this is already a franchise where it's like, oh, I don't want to say already, cause again, we uh, we kill Han, we kill uh, Luke. And I mean, Leia dies because Leia, like the actress, died in real life. I don't even yeah. think we would have killed her in this movie otherwise. But um, like, people have died in the previous two movies, so it's not. And again, like I, I don't know. I feel even conflicted as I'm trying to get these words out because. Well, know the, way that I, the way that I think about it is, you were right earlier when you said it would have been a really meaningful, impactful moment if Chewie had died at the hands of our protagonist who's like this really nice, good person, but does she have something in her that might like be this uncontrollable thing that gets people killed? That- would have given more credence to the um, Ray potentially going to the dark side idea that yeah. we just keep playing lip service to, but don't actually explore. And even if she doesn't actually like go there, because I wouldn't want her to go there like, of course, but we're not doing gonna... enough actu actual legwork to make me think that she even could. Yeah, and like, why make her Palpatine at all if you're not actually going to explore the whole notion of like, maybe there is something inside of me that's wrong and evil, and I have to like, that's in conflict with the good part of me. Like, her killing the truly... like nature versus nurture thing, but you have to actually do the legwork and explore it to make it interesting. Yeah, we give her a scene where she thinks she killed Chewie. But like already, like with the tone of these scenes, we're, we're kind of past that. If this movie was about sort of like clearing the board of all the old guard who were left behind after after Force Awakens and Jedi, like if we end this trilogy with everyone from the original trilogy is gone and it really is up to the new guys to just carry on, that would have been meaningful. If, if Chewie did die, if C-3PO really did say goodbye. And like, that would have been a meaningful moment because Ray, everyone's like arguing their points and Ray is like, 3PO, what do you think we should do? And he has this moment of he's like, oh, you actually care what I think? Because hardly anyone like asks him to volunteer what he wants to do at any moment. And he's like, okay, you know what? This, this, this is beyond me. Like it would be worth it if I did this. If that C three PO's last moment, that would have been really cool. That would have been like really meaningful. But nope, just bring him back. And this is our sort of like, like you say, lip service to giving Poe an arc in this movie, where it's like he starts from kind of a cynical place and he has to accept that, like, have hope there are more of them, there are more of us than there are of them. And I think starting him from that place in this movie fundamentally misses the point at the end of The Last Jedi, where it's like he was like, we sent out a distress signal and no one showed up. And it's like, that's that's not the note that he ends on in that movie. The note he ends on in that movie is Luke shows up and he's like, he's giving us a chance to get away. It doesn't matter if no one else showed up right now. If we get out of this, then we are the spark of hope that will like light the fire that will burn the, Revol uh, the First Order down. I think it's a mistake to come into this movie and be like the the arc that Poe needs to go on is he needs to find that hope again. No, he ended the last movie with that hope. And it's weird to not, you know, give them any of that at all. 
like we've we've given them hope and then we get to this movie and no one it doesn't seem like anyone else joined the resistance yeah well maybe hmm, i don't know how true that is because again it's hard to tell with like crowd shots and stuff there's well, not there's that and the fact that we're not doing any real world building and we're not talking about it yeah which is another massive problem with all three of these movies even the last jedi to a degree um but i mean part of that is with Last Jedi, we end with there's enough people to fit on the Millennium Falcon, which is not a big ship. And it definitely seems like there's more than that at the start of this movie. I mean, but, I mean, again, with the way that Poe is acting, yeah, it's like we barely have as much people than we do when we left the end of the last movie. And we've had, what, a year in between? Uh, at least. Potentially yeah. more than that. Who knows? Like, time has passed. And they don't have, like, at least from the way that, that Poe is acting, and even to a, a smaller degree, Finn, it's like we don't have that much more people than what we started with coming out of the end of Last Jedi. Yeah. So it's like we, we haven't really made a ton of progress. And just, like, to what I was talking about earlier as far as so much of this stuff is padding for time. We're almost an hour into this movie. We will be well past an hour by the time that they find Chewie and get him out and, like, escape. And, like, wiping C-3PO's memories, getting to this place in the first place, getting Chewie out. Aside from we learn the Palpatine twist, which could have happened anywhere... Ray and uh, Kylo didn't need to be face to face for that to have happened. And we learn what's on the knife, which could have just been inscribed in a non Sith language. What really, for the purposes of the story, was contributed by any of this running around from location to location stuff? And what's even worse about um, the fake I was C3PO is A, I hate that line that he says about. Uh, I'm taking one last look at my friends. Stop pretending like you have the exact same relationship with these people that you have with the people in the original trilogy. I don't read that into it. Like, I mean, that's... It's... what the, the problem is, that line, even if I accept that he's friends with these characters, which I do, the way that, the first that, movie. that line is for the audience. I know, and it's, but it's not, it doesn't fit in the actual movie. Yeah, no, um, I'm saying that's the problem. Yeah, that's, that's more playing to the nostalgia thing. It's, you know, C C3PO actually had a relationship with Luke and Leia and was a big part of the original trilogy. Not this one. He was, yeah. Yeah. he was essentially just set dressing in those first two movies from this trilogy. Like, that line does not belong in this movie, and it's just more uh, fan nostalgia and, you know, pandering. That's all that is. Yeah. Like, I don't even read into it, like, it's it's the movies acting like C-3PO has the same relationship with them. Like, it's even worse than that because it's it's not even playing on 3PO's relationship with Luke and Leia and Han. It's playing on the fact that the audience cares about him. So he might as well be looking at the camera to you, the viewer, when he says that. Yeah. It, I mean, either way, it's it's pretty bad. Yeah, it doesn't actually make sense in context of this movie. Um, and this is a this is a classic Star Wars thing that I'm not going to complain about because we do it all the time. Um, like invading the place, picking someone up, and then getting out. No, no, not even that. Um, us managing managing to murder as many of the troops as we do, and then we get captured, and they don't just shoot us all. They have no good reason to keep us alive anyway. But, you know, we just, we get captured because, you know, we need a movie. Yeah. <laughs> we need a movie to keep going. That's the only reason that all of them are not just shot dead on site when they get captured here in a few seconds. And again, part of that, plus like what I mentioned with the whole Last Jedi sets us up to potentially move away from just Merc and Stormtroopers left and right, and then we start doing it again. Part of me wonders... How much of that is J.J. Abrams just like not being a storyteller and not caring about what Last Jedi was doing thematically and all that stuff? And how much of that is maybe Chris Terrio? Because that's a similar problem to the Batman v Superman stuff, where 
when Batman is killing people all over that movie and even Superman to a degree, you're just supposed to not think about it because they're bad guys. It's almost like they don't know that people are getting killed in those scenes. Yeah. So like who 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 is that? Is that more Abrams or is that more Terrio? I wonder. I mean, Zack Snyder is the one actually putting the action together. Um so True. In, the case, in the case of BVS, I would True. say that's much more Zack Snyder, especially since as a writer, you're not thinking about how exactly the action is going to be laid out and framed. That is more the director. Yeah. Cinematography. In a, in, a, in a script, it's often, you know, these two characters fight, there's an altercation, and it ends with, in this scenario, this guy wins or the other guy wins or it's a stalemate, what have you. The specifics of that are rarely laid out in, in a script. Um, I'm going to be interested to see how, because um, we know Ahsoka is actually going to be cast in live action for Mandalorian season two. And mm. um, if you go to the behind the scenes for The Witcher, I know you haven't even seen that show yet, but if you go into behind the scenes, Henry Cavill talks about how he had the hilt for the, the sword like made downward so that he could actually hold it backward and maneuver it with his wrist. Um, yeah. and, and even actual swordsmen will tell you like, Fighting uh, with an actual sword um, with it, you know, aimed downward is not very practical. Um, and the more weight behind that, the harder it is to actually make us effective strikes with a sword held downward. Um, that was also part of the, the reasoning for uh, giving Ahsoka um, a lightsaber with a smaller blade. Because if you look close, um, at Ahsoka's blades throughout the Clone Wars, they're not, um, they don't have the same length. One of them is actually significantly shorter. Mm. And so the, she, she uses them almost like scythes, like Raphael. Um, and you can tell it's not easy for Rey to do that. Um, I don't really know why she's, I, I guess because um, the, uh, like the, the love for ah Ahsoka has slipped into how Fight choreographers, fight choreographers are having her fight in this film, but using a downward angle like that, and she only has the one standard length lightsaber. It's it's interesting because that's not there's not a whole lot of practicality in that. That would be pretty difficult to make effective strikes against someone who is not holding their lightsaber like that. Yeah, I hate this. I hate this so much. I the hate big trailer, the big trailer moment. No, I hate the sort of like really cowardly, like we can't even commit to just turning on back on Last Jedi. Like this whole, your parents were nobodies because they chose to be. I wasn't lying the first time. Like, no, that, no. The scene in Last Jedi plays out very deliberately where he's like, I know what your parents were. You know what your parents were. You've known the whole time. You've just been burying it. Tell me, because I know that you know. And Ray is the one who's like, they were nobodies. It's like they were filthy drunk traders. They left you for like booze, for drinking money. And this movie goes back on that, but it doesn't even have the courage to go back on it all the way. It's like, what I told you was true from a certain point of view. No, that's so stupid. Like a lot of decisions in this movie. Yeah. Like, I'm more mad than I would be if they just straight up said, like, I was lying, or haha, I tricked you, or you got it wrong the first time. No, they try to have it both ways. Yeah. They want to pretend like they're not contra blatantly contradicting that movie. Mm hmm. Um, and I hate this whole thing with Hux. I really wish that we went the more methodical. He's trying to usurp um, Kylo in some way. And, and he's like, essentially trying to do that. Yeah. Like, if if part of him trying to usurp Kylo is helping the good guys in small ways, I think that could have actually been really interesting. To make but it a big mystery and twist and 
Ooh, you didn't know it was the Hux. And as soon as we introduce it, we are going to kill him in the next scene. Yeah. It's just even like the story ideas that maybe could have worked are really bad. Like really just like wasted and squandered. Like she she thinks Luke is a legend, um, at least initially, but she's so shocked when she hears Palpatine. And Palpatine himself isn't mentioned in Last Jedi either. So it's like, how does No, again, he's mentioned once by the name Sidious. So like yeah. we don't have any indication of like Ray knows who that is beyond just this one bad guy that Luke mentioned briefly. And but but I mean she would know who he is given the brief at the beginning of the movie. But it's like she doesn't have there's no impact. Yeah, there's no impact. This is the I am your father thing, but with none of the impact. Yeah. Not helped by the fact that she's getting the information secondhand. Um, like, we also severely, we need a better handle on what to do with the bad guys of Star Wars moving forward. That's a big thing for me. We know Taika Waititi is doing the next Star Wars movie, whatever it is. Because mm -hmm. um, there was all this talk in the last movie about burn the past, let it die, um, the First Order, uh, the Resistance, it all needs to go away. And he's just ruling over the, the First Order in this movie. There is no difference whatsoever. Um, yeah, like his plan is still nominally the same, where he's like, let's kill Palpatine just like we killed Snoke and then take over and it'll be you and me. But it just... We're still going to run things the exact same way. It's just going to be us running the First Order. Yeah. Or the, the final movie. order because Palpatine pulled out legions of ships and troops from beneath Exegol from out of nowhere. Like, where, were those people just waiting there indefinitely? Where did they come from? And we'll do the same thing in the climax with the with that weird like cult of people surrounding him and Ray and like are those real people. What what is happening? And like here's the thing: people have all of their takes, many of which, most of which, I agree with in so far as just like Ray Palpatine and specifically. Like the line, you don't just have power, you have his power. That removes a lot of agency from Ray. It does. And also just like, weirdly enough, Bloodshot of all movies highlights why this twist isn't just a bad story choice, but bad messaging. Where we have this moment in Bloodshot that isn't actually built up to it all in that movie, where he like uses up all of his nanobots and the bad guy's like, yeah, you, you've, you've used all your stuff. All that's left is Ray Garrison. And he's like, that's enough. Like the point of like what we did in Last Jedi should have been to eventually get Ray to a place where she's like, I'm Ray, I'm just Ray, and that's enough. Maybe that wasn't what JJ had in mind with The Force Awakens, but he and everyone else forfeited control over the answer to that question to Ryan. And it's really unfortunate for this movie and just Star Wars as a wider franchise, I think, with like what they're trying to say to audiences that they decide that her being just herself isn't enough. One person from nowhere isn't allowed to actually matter to the universe. Her power isn't her own now. It's just because she's a descendant of Palpatine. Yeah. Like all of her significance is contributed to like a quirk of genetics. And that really, really sucks. She's just the granddaughter of the really old guy who's insanely powerful. And then like, so, oh, we're, we're about to get to one of weirdly, like one of simultaneously the worst and <laughs> one of the, one of the better lightsaber fights. It's weird. Yeah. But like, before we get too far away from it, like, you know what it's like? It's like uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2. It's like taking Peter Parker and saying only he could have been Spider-Man because 
the spiders were engineered for his like bloodline. That's what this is. Ugh. Yeah, that's pretty bad. It's taking something that was like the word that someone used for it was like what Last Jedi did was democratize the Force, and it was a really interesting thing to do and really uplifting to be like you don't have to come from somewhere special to be special, and this movie says no, you do, and that really bothers me. Like that makes me kind of mad. You know, it's it's interesting that. Um... I mean, we, we brought up the concept of Finn, like, eventually being getting the other clones, not clones, I keep saying I want to say clones because I'm such a fan of Clone Wars, um, getting the other stormtroopers to, uh, to turn against the Order. That, while I, I do like that on paper, that would have put him away from Rey again. Um, and another thing I don't like about this movie is... Um, how much legwork we're doing to make me invested in both her and Finn. We don't really get to see them together almost at all in Last Jedi. And then we get to this movie and Finn has this thing that he constantly wants to say. And Oh God, we haven't even talked about that. You're right. He's not saying it. And we will later make that I'm force sensitive. Uh, I mean, I'd take him saying I'm force sensitive over no. what the actually that is, does, that, which is, that, is not, that is not what he says to Ray right before he thinks he's going to die when they're on the quicksand. That's that's you're right. What, that would be dumb. It'd be really dumb. What's dumber is saying nothing. The movie just drops it. <sighs> yeah, it's it's Poe so brought it up right before Hux was gonna shoot them. That's the last time it's gonna come up. We've already passed the end of that through line in this movie. It's never going to be mentioned again. Yeah, we already talked over it. That's so infuriating. Ugh. And like, I don't know how I feel about it being like the force is what stopped some of the stormtroopers from like killing people and like influencing them to find their own freedom. And like, I, I don't know how I feel about that. Like, with that being the whole Finn is Force-sensitive thing, I do think it would have been more meaningful if, like, again, you can argue they're raised from birth or, like, they're captured as very young children and indoctrinated with all this stuff. When we open The Force Awakens, that's Finn's first mission, and there's something I think about seeing that blood and carnage firsthand that would naturally jar someone out of that, even with a lot of indoctrination. I think that is more impactful than just the force started exerting its will on people. And that's that more plot device stuff that you say you're more or less indifferent to with this franchise. And like the, the problem with force do anything. The problem with it is in other instances, it's not taking away agency from anybody. My issue is like what was Finn's choice and what could have been these characters making choices is instead this third party influencing things. And that's one of my big problems with the prequels, where so much of the prequel story is predicated on characters are acting dumber than they should, or characters who should have decent foresight aren't foreseeing things because the force is like clouded and like is influencing their personalities or whatever. That feels really cheap to me. If we're using the force as not a plot device, but like an excuse to have people like either act out of character or make character decisions that they wouldn't have otherwise, that's really bad and dumb. Like, why is it not, what's wrong with a bunch of stormtroopers just realize they don't want to do this? Because there's no, we can't have any real nuance. Everything has to be just real surface, platitude the force, and it's got mm -hmm. to be ethereal and mystical and stuff. Yeah. That's what classic Star Wars is. And, like, if they made it a spiritual thing, like, if they actually talked about it beyond what we get, and is like, the force is kind of like religion, 
and that like it can exist in you and like you can believe in the values even if you don't fully subscribe to whatever like something anything more than just the forces out there and it'll sometimes tell you to do things that you don't want to do like it's an actual sentient thing that will just influence you and push you to wherever the plot needs you to go yeah pretty much which may be part of that part of that to be fair to this movie is not just this movie's problem that's a problem with the force since basically empire where we decide actually what it is because in a new hope it's just magic pretty much like it's a magic system and then Empire Yoda brings into the whole the spirituality angle of it is like the force isn't again, it's it's what we do in Last Jedi. The force is not a power. It is literally the will of the universe. And so it's kind of a problem that you were always gonna run into with almost any of these movies, which is we've basically said that within the fiction of these films, the force is pretty much the will of God. And how can you keep writing the literal will of God into your movie without it feeling cheap? And constantly inconsistent. Mm -hmm. Th that's another really annoying thing um, is the idea of like the balance. So it's like, since the balance is something that's supposed to happen naturally um through the force um uh, because kylo ren's a powerful sith user ray is his counterbalance as opposed yeah. to them just naturally being what they are and making um individual choices and having agency mm -hmm. um i also i hate this i don't hate the I'm really conflicted about this fight. <laughs> I, I really am. Really uh, yeah. Especially because, so, I, I'm going to wait till we actually get to the fight part. This, it's this, me, but with mascara. Right? When, when she hisses at Ray and she jumps back. She gets uh, shark mouth. Yeah, it's really unintentionally funny. It's right here. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I laugh every time. Okay. Just, like, I don't understand what the point of that was. It's not like... Again, we don't fully commit to... If you're Sith, you go shark teeth. Yeah, no. <laughs> okay, so here's what's really dumb about this. Um, <laughs> so, Kylo Ren breaks the, the Wayfinder. Uh -huh. And... Um, Ray just gets angry and just starts flailing her lightsaber around. So basically the impetus for this fight is you can't progress. You just made it so I can't progress the plot any further. So I'm just going to very pettily and angrily swing my lightsaber at you and try to kill you. That's very Jedi-like. Um, I mean, I think you could make the argument that like this conversation, that vision she just had fighting herself, she's not in a good place right now. She's thinking like, maybe he's right. Maybe I do belong on the dark side, but I don't want to accept that. And him breaking that is like the straw that breaks the camel's back. And she's just like, she is just throwing a tantrum pretty much. And this is another thing where like, this is oddly, I doubt, I very much doubt this was on purpose because I just, I don't trust JJ or anyone to be thinking on that level. But compare this fight to the fight that you have a problem with in The Force Awakens, mm -hmm. where my my reasoning for why she wins that one is that Kylo is just like he's angry, he's not thinking straight, he's he's got a lot on his mind, and that's distracting him. The Kylo same thing is holding back this entire fight, and I also he wins anyway. Yeah, he wins this fight, and she only gets to like best him because of Leia. So I think that's a probably not intentional parallel where like when the two of them are fighting, whichever one of them is not like in the best emotional state is the one that's just kind of swinging wildly and is bound to lose because they just, they're not 
their head isn't in the game. This is what we've done to a uh, defense character. He just gets to chase after the girl, the girl and say, Ray! And then just literally get tossed back like a sack yeah. of potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> it's so unfortunate that we could not have done more, more with this character. And like in a different story, that would be a meaningful beat where like we've talked, like her and Finn had that conversation earlier of like, People keep saying that they know me. I don't think anyone does. And he's he's really trying to be there for her. And she's at a point now where she's just like, no, it's just me. Like, you don't have a place here. Like, piss off, pretty much. And she's not even thinking about it like that. But again, her emotions are just getting the better of her. Um, I like the water. I like how this is shot, but this, see, this this is cool, but it doesn't have, there is not, oh, sorry, I would say this. Number one, um, Kylo feels like he's holding back this entire fight, and I don't know why. His mission is to kill her. Um, I guess to he's pad the fight out. Makes said he's not doing that. He's already said, I don't actually care what Palpatine wants. My goal is that you and me take him down together. But he's clearly going to kill her before Leia comes in and is like, Ben, and then I'm just dies. Yeah, that's true. He, he, he rears his lightsaber back like he's going to swing it and kill her. Like, and also there's just something about this fight that like... You see, it, like at this, at this point, yeah, he's, he's toying with her. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this much, I like that this fight doesn't have any score under it. Uh, so do I. Choice. But yeah, I'm like, I don't know if it's because they're like jumping around and stuff, like jumping 50 feet in the air. This fight feels way less tactile and way less like real feeling than all of the other lightsaber fights in these movies. Well, I don't need a lightsaber fight to necessarily feel quote unquote real, especially since I'm a big fan of Clone Wars, and there's a lot of flipping around and like intricate and yeah, it's not that it's bad on its own. It's just that it's coming in fighting movies. Oh, just the thing you got to do is you got to keep it quick and raw and vicious. They have to feel like they're actually trying to kill Kylo Ren. He's he's just toying with her so this fight can be longer. Mm -hmm. And stab. Um, I hate stuff like this. We're not going to keep him dead, so don't even... Why are you wasting our time with this right now? Um, I don't even think this is meant to be, like, making the audience think he's going to die. I think it's just, it makes sense that we have Ray take a second to be like, oh, God, what have I done? Like, I don't think we're dragging this out so the audience thinks he's going to die. I think this is for her to, like, think for a second. Uh, I mean, I mean, sure, that's that's there, but you know, she stabbed him with a whole lightsaber. <laughs> like, no, we're supposed to think that he is going to die, and then she just heals him. Like, she spent. I don't care that she's in a temper tantrum because he broke her way to get to Exegol. She spent the better part of how long is this fight? Three and a half minutes trying to kill him over him breaking something like this is not tony and and steve and you know bucky killed my parents like it's not that yeah she, no. she very pointedly tries to kill him because she has a temper tantrum and then is like oh no what have i done let me just take that right back it's we have lost track of who this character is if we even had a sense of that at all because or at the very least, I think that's too far. I think we've lost track of this relationship. I think the dynamic between the two of them has just succumbed to how convoluted the plotting of this movie is. So, like, Ray and Kylo have a really interesting relationship, but it suffers because way too much of this movie is about using characters in service of plot points. And then just leaves Finn there without a second thought. 
I hate that we have Finn just playing second fiddle, chasing after this girl who's not interested in him at all. Like, mm-hmm. like after that first movie, I would have thought that um, JJ would have at least had some respect to do something with them that felt in yeah. any way endearing no. or satisfying at all. But he's too busy playing damage control for Last Jedi, at least for the people who didn't like that movie. And again, this movie doesn't have respect for anyone. So like, I. Can't... I keep wanting to feel bad for specific characters and actors, but like, no, no one was serviced well by this movie. Not a single person in it. Not even Kylo, who is, until this movie, the most interesting character in this trilogy. And of course, there's, there's the fact that we're gonna have our scene with Kylo coming up. He's gonna talk to uh, his hallucinatory dad. And then that will be the last dialogue he has through the whole movie. And just, like this whole thing is stupid and doesn't track and doesn't actually make sense. I um, I'm so lost. Because- it make a degree of sense. So he has a hallucination with his dad. And I guess his dad is telling him everything he wants to hear. Like he and his head is trying to justify all his atrocities and everything he's done. And his dad would forgive him. So I, at least that's what he thinks in his head. So I'm like, yeah, I, I should be forgiven. And I'm just going to toss away my leadership of the order and join the good guys. Now, like, there's no real organic turn here that makes any degree of sense. Like, this is not, this isn't Anakin finally got, not Anakin, this isn't um Luke finally got through to Anakin Skywalker. Yeah, no. <laughs> buried underneath Darth Vader like this is I'm just psycho talking to myself and my mom died saying my name and I'm suddenly a good like this is more convoluted and hard to follow than the Martha thing and from BVS okay so there are a couple of things that I want to talk about here first of all is that speaking of BVS this is literally that scene in that movie where he talks to his hallucinatory dad where it's like even in a universe where there's a precedent for talking to ghosts, like, Tom Solo's not a force ghost. Like, he's literally, he's having a, a, an episode right now. He's talking to nothing. Yeah. And, and so, like, Cinema Wins, who really likes this movie and has a lot of takes that I'm, uh, whatever, his read on this is that because so much of this is almost word for word parroting their exchange in the force awakens this is more of a purely symbolic thing where he's for the first time viewing that conversation from the other side and like i suppose that's interesting on paper but the way it's executed of where he just walks up and they just start talking it's just it doesn't work and there was the little line in there that I hate and that really encapsulates to me why Kylo Ren's like redemption arc doesn't work and why to varying degrees I don't think Darth Vader's redemption arc works which is he's like your son is dead and Han is like no Kylo Ren is dead my son is alive it's like they are the same person I hate it when these movies and fans of these movies treat Darth Vader and Anakin Skywalker or Kylo Ren and Ben Solo as if they are two separate characters. These are not characters with schizophrenia. They're not two separate identities living in one body. They are the same person. They're also, it's not also not the dual identity thing. Like it isn't the Spider-Man versus Peter Parker thing either. Mm -hmm. There's not a persona. Yeah, it's not a persona he's put, I mean. Like Kylo Ren. Kylo Ren was a persona that Ben Solo was trying to pull, but he was doing it poorly, and we get rid of that persona like before The Force Awakens is over. Um, I don't know if we necessarily get rid of it by the end of Force Awakens, but that's definitely the point of the opening of Last Jedi. Mm-hmm. With him destroying the mask and um, Snoke looking down on him and saying he's just a scared little boy in a mask. Yeah, and it's just like, no, I don't get it. And it's it's how the narrative and a lot of the fans justify the redemption arc where, and this, I, I meant to mention this way earlier, but I had a conversation with someone who was like, they really didn't like the ending to Rogue One because 
before Return of the Jedi, where we get our redemption arc for uh, Darth Vader, and he quote unquote becomes Anakin Skywalker again, we hadn't really seen him do all that much terrible stuff on screen. Like he'd sanctioned a lot of terrible things, but we didn't really see him straight up like hacking innocent people to bits until the end of Rogue One and parts of the prequels. And he felt like that undermined our like attempting to redeem him and say, after he performs one big redemptive act, he's a good person again. I never had that problem because I always felt like we knew implicitly Vader was doing stuff that bad just off screen. But if you want because he force choked someone and how scared everyone acts of him. Yeah. yeah. Like Vader is like doing stuff like this all the time. But if you want to subscribe to that, then Kylo Ren has it worse because from the beginning we've seen him like murder innocent people, murder his own people, like have generally no regard for anyone except himself and maybe Ray, but even that is filtered through a very self-interested lens. And just we've seen him be terrible too consistently on screen. There for, is no redeeming this character. Which yeah. Is why we even tried to do it. Like you can't in like I do agree with you to a degree. Even um e even Darth Vader's redemption in the original trilogy is a little it's a little wobbly. That's, I don't mm -hmm. I don't know if I fully even buy that. But Kylo is like, very wobbly. It's I mean it, it doesn't have a solid foundation at all. There yeah. is no wobble. It's complete crumble. Yeah, um, it, it doesn't have a leg to stand on. And like, I think the one way that it maybe could work, and this is the thing that people suggested, is like he doesn't die. He doesn't do the Darth Vader thing where he does one big good thing, and that's supposed to make him a good person. No, he and the movies have to acknowledge that if redemption is possible, it's going to take a long time. And you don't if, think you just do it through one act, especially yeah. if you it multiple acts of genocide and mass murder yeah the thing about like martyring yourself is that it's the easy way out and like yeah. it can't be so easy you can't just have a get out of jail free card where you do one good thing and then you die and that means you never have to own up to your actions because you're dead it's like that's really lame and yeah, like we're at, the, we're, we're at the loop and yeah, there's a yes. lot to say here, but before that, there was a really cute moment earlier with uh, with Poe and Finn, where Poe's like, uh, I'm making you general. And Finn's like, I got something to talk to you about. Thank you, by the way, general, general. <laughs> that was really nice. It was really nice, yeah. One of the but, better scenes in this movie. Again, like, the the chemistry here and the actors, they are, they, they're, not, they're the best thing about this movie. Yeah. When it's Ray, Finn, and Poe, or any like pair within the three of them, just having a little like character relationship beat, that stuff really works, I think. And like whether or not Finn and Ray end up where you'd want them to end up, like when it's the two of them just talking to each other in the brief scenes that we get of that, I think that's I think that's good stuff. Like there's a genuine drama there, and like I care about both of them. I remember feeling like this was the one scene, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, since you're uh, you love Last Jedi more than anyone I know. This was the only scene in the movie that didn't feel all that disrespectful to Last Jedi. Yeah, no, it feels just, just, to, just to be on this island again and to have Luke, you know, shake her out of her disillusionment and her, you know, feeling like she needs to give up. Yeah, um, and like people say that about the line where he grabs the lightsaber and he's like, a Jedi's weapon deserves more respect than this. It's like, no, this is all pretty in line with The Last Jedi because the point of that movie is that by the end, he realizes that he was wrong to be so cynical. So yeah, no, I, I totally buy that after The Last Jedi, he has this attitude in this movie. This is just retconning so, so that we can, so that it makes any degree of sense why... Leia would be training Ray at all. Mm -hmm. I guess why Leia would be able to do the thing that you don't think is an issue, but what I absolutely hate in Last Jedi is her just force pulling herself out of the vacuum of space and being completely fine. And like the de-aging there is unbelievably insanely good. I feel like it's really good on Luke. There's something about 
Leia when she lifts her mask up. I'm like, this looks a little weird. I have a hard time even computing them as the same person. Luke, um, on the other hand, is definitely, uh, well, I mean, I guess aged well. Like, he looks completely different, but what I mean is um, that's, like, I look at him younger and can he feels he feels more instantly recognizable to me. Because um, mm. when, I, when I go back to uh, the original trilogy, which is, which is not often, um, Carrie Fisher looks completely different to me. Yeah. So to see her, so her de aged um, doesn't, I don't have a huge reaction to it because I don't associate her face a lot with the character. I know that sounds weird, but what I mean is when I look at her in this trilogy versus the other, she doesn't look the same at all to me. She can almost be played by two different actresses. I get what you mean. I don't have a problem with this. Like yeah, we we're just about calling really... back to Empire Strikes Back with this. It's and and like we 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 talked about this earlier. On no level is this movie Luke's movie. He has a cameo and he hardly impacts the story at all, giving him this like worshipful hero moment of like we we like blast out the score and like the reverent sort of camera move of the X-wing coming up. It's like in no way is this Luke's movie. Why does he have this big crowd please moment? If anything, Ray should have lifted that X-wing out of there. Just for the fans, because again, we're just playing, we're just placating the nostalgia. Yeah, that is all JJ knows how to do with this particular franchise. Yeah, like again, you really gotta assume that the reason Force Awakens worked the way that it did is because it had Kasdan on it. And that, this is he wasn't also trying to placate. Um, uh, an extremely toxic and incredibly loud uh, fan base and mm -hmm. reaction to the previous movie that he didn't even have anything to do with. Yeah. Well, hey, we've got uh, 3PO's memory back. So, uh, yeah, it's back. Yep, because there are no yeah. actual consequences in this movie. Like, uh... And see, like the one... Dead. And uh, he does, he still gets to keep his memory... And Ray's still alive, even though we kill her, and then bring her right back. The one plot point that Dio contributed to this movie was kind of made moot because Ray contributed that same plot point literally seconds later. <laughs> She's showing us the way. I guess we didn't even need that guy. Yeah, honestly, why is he in this movie? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. He's a plush toy someone's going to buy. Yeah. But I, I, I'm a, I am in large agreement with you in regards to the first chunk of this movie. Like, like the action scenes and the character moments, those are really fun and will carry you through and make it watchable. Yeah, um, but you get into the later story stuff and and even some of the earlier story stuff, and it's just it's real groany, real contrived, real convoluted and nonsensical and painfully inconsistent. Kill yeah. her. I don't I didn't want you to kill me at all. It was all a part of my plan. You're supposed to kill me. <laughs> that I ooh, we're going to have to save that for when we get to that, because that's. I'm not exaggerating when I say like his plan changes like five times in the space of five minutes. It feels like every part of that scene was written like on the day of shooting. They didn't know what they were going to do until they had him in the makeup and in the chair. I was like, we're just going to have him say some stuff. People will like it. And like this, this highlights another thing that, okay, so I just want to mention like very briefly, this is a little weird, not like even necessarily in a bad way, but I can't recall any other Star Wars movie with an honest to goodness montage like this. Like it was pretty brief, but is like Is it really a montage or is it really just them gearing up and leaving? Because it's a gearing up and leaving montage. Especially since we nested it, like we bookended it with the night before. That's that's such a thing that like no other Star Wars movie has done. 
It's like, again, it's not even a problem. It's just weird to me that this movie decided to do that. But um, that, that yeah, is definitely a more modern and less timeless thing. Yeah. And like them uh, going over that whole plan highlights to me like my big issue with all this, which is just like the scale nuts. And you mentioned with um, Clone Wars how that show's just ended and it didn't feel the need to like balloon it. So look at this. This is too much. We've got this is absolutely insane. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I, I get it. It's the end of the Skywalker saga. This this is really this feels really hokey. Like the sheer massive scale of this. It's way too much. This is like Bay Transformers on steroids. Like I don't feel like even they would have done this. It's a whole planet of ships with star killing weapons on them. Like what? Like, I mean, geez. And it's just, you get the sense that they're not even about it. Like, and see, that's as, as big as this, like, as big as this fleet is, the whole firefight and, like, ship's battle sequence with them is, it's not even that... Like, it's nothing. It's pretty disposable, generic action fare. Yeah. And, uh, on top of that, like, I still feel like the best, um, like, of these firefights in Star Wars that we've had is in Rogue One. A lot of Rogue One, mm. like, actually feels like a legitimate war movie. Yeah. It feels, it feels really tactical. You know part of that is? Yeah. It feels like there's a real sense of tactics going on where, like, it almost does the Star Trek thing of it's like a naval battle. Like one side will do something and then the other side reacts and then an action and then a reaction. Here it is That's, just kind of Sun Fury. Yeah, this is just a whole bunch of lasers and explosions on screen with no real sense of, you know, tactics or direction or anything. It's just stuff happening on screen. People like it. If they had any tactics... Because I highly doubt that the First Order cares about, like, blasting their own, or, I'm sorry, the Final Order. Oh, so yeah. There, there is a line about, um, like, getting closer to them, because it's like, they can't fire on us without hitting their own. I really don't think they care, you guys. <laughs> like, realistically, like, they would all show up, and they would just I, be... I really don't like that we never see the inside. We don't know if there's even actual living uh, stormtroopers in any of these ships. Well, there has to be, right? There because be. these things can't operate by themselves. They're not like AI. They're not AI. And but it's so weird. Like that's another weird thing about the troopers in this movie, and especially Finn, since we don't do anything with his arc in relation to the clones in this movie, even though we mm -hmm. clearly should. Um, he seems completely apathetic about killing them at this point. Um, like even the earlier scene when he was rescuing Chewie and he was shooting. Troopers left and right. Yep. Um, it's just another day at the office. He feels totally fine with it. There's no indication that he's running into anyone he knows. And he used to be one of these guys. Yeah. And it's so weird that we're just treating him like disposable cannon fodder, especially in regards to to him, because he was one. <sighs> Not even a year ago, or like just about a year ago, he was a trooper. And, you know, riding horses on a spaceship because that's a thing that we decided to do. Yeah, and they could easily... They don't have to stay completely uh, horizontal like this. They could easily, you know, tip over and just let them all slide off. That's true. Why don't they just do that? <laughs> like, no, there's got to be... There's got to be, like, individual members on each and every one of these ships. Where did they come from? How... How yeah. did any of where did any of this stuff come from? How did he do all of this with no one in the galaxy finding out about? Like, and then if no one knew he was setting all this up, why would he just randomly make his presence known before we before we even start the movie? Why now? Mm. 
Like, there's no world building in this movie. And in a franchise like this, I mean, this has been a problem with all three of these movies, but in a franchise like this, you need world building. And just, like, so much of this comes from the same problem or, like, the same place of why we brought Palpatine back in the first place, which is just the fans see desire to make this the end of the Skywalker saga. So that's where the scale problem comes in. We have to bring Palpatine back because I guess we've accepted that it's not really an ending to the Skywalker saga if we don't deal with him. It's all so much not servicing the story of the previous two movies for the sake of like putting a nice little button on the franchise. So instead of being the last movie of this trilogy, it's prioritizing being the last Star Wars movie. And people think of Palpatine as the bad guy of all Star Wars, right? Or people would think of like the- That's JJ's reasoning in an interview. He more or less says, yeah, I brought Palpatine back because he was the villain of the original trilogy. And, and wouldn't it make sense to bring him back? And no, JJ, no, it doesn't. It doesn't make sense to bring him back. That's not the story of these movies. Not the and story like, of these movies. He was dead. And this is not an interesting character to begin with. He never, the most interesting thing with him is the idea of playing both sides of like back during the Clone Wars, how he was playing both sides and there were all these mass manipulations. Like that was actually really interesting. Um, but just him as a character, especially in regards to the original trilogy, he's barely a character. He's just the the evil bad guy. Yeah. Okay, so he said, I never wanted you dead. I wanted you here. That's one moment where our main villain has completely changed his motivations and tactics. And uh, it will not be the last time. Um, this is kind of interesting how they can just, you know, kneel like this with no cover whatsoever and not get hit. How is the... I just, yeah. There's things literally all around them. They should be being attacked from every angle. There's, the, there's not even a little bit of stakes whatsoever. I mean, we killed any sense of stakes when we fake killed Chewie and then like fake took CPO's memory away and then fake killed Kylo Ren. Like there's yeah. so many fake outs and cop outs littered throughout this movie that it's it, it's hard to want to be invested at all or take this at all seriously. And again, part of that is the scale thing where it's like, I, Watching The Force Awakens and The Last Jedi, at no point do I feel like those movies are building up to confrontation of this size. Where the climax of both of those films, like there's your big space battle and stuff, and a lot of stuff goes down, and there's a lot of collateral damage, and we destroy some big ships and kaboom, kapow explosions. But those movies, when it comes time to like get in the nitty gritty of it, it is a very personal one person v one person or one person v two people and that's the crux of the climax here that's what they're trying to go for with ray and palpatine but it just doesn't land because it's surrounded by this ridiculous like degree of space battling it's like I get it. I get that you want to end on the biggest bang possible because it's Star Wars, it's a big franchise, and this is the quote-unquote last movie in the saga. You shouldn't feel like you have to force yourself to be as huge as possible because there is no inherent value in hugeness. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't want to say, like, you know, scale is always, like, going, going bigger scale is always inherently worse. Um, it, I mean, it's just, and you have so many, there's so many of these ships that aren't even involved because I mean, it's just so many. If all of those ships were actually involved in sending out fighters, that it, they'd be massacred. If two of them were doing that, they'd probably be massacred. Like, because when you actually stop and think, there are so many other ships that are just floating around and aren't doing anything. 
because there are just too many. Yeah, I just I just don't understand why we open this movie with Palpatine raises an entire a, planet worth of ships of store of star destroyers just from like out of nowhere. Like the first order, we're not lacking in resources at the end of Last Jedi. Just have him use what Ren's already got. And even then, why do you need that many? Like, what are you going to lord over if everyone is dead? Ugh. That's another really annoying thing that I don't like about this this franchise. Just the whole franchise in general. Um, what the Empire? Well, there's a slightly better sense of what the Empire wants, I guess, but. What do they ultimately want? Just to rule a galaxy? Generically just be in charge of everything? Just lord over everything? And like part of that is they are clearly Nazis, but because this is a family-friendly adventure franchise, we can't have them be racist. That that's annoying. Um and I mean, even if I mean, yeah, the the not the Nazi allegory is pretty obvious even though we're not exploring that because you know we don't have any teeth and this is a family friendly franchise at the same time it would be nice to give them an actual motivation of some kind what does the empire want what does the first order actually want what is the end game what is the goal what is the point of this war the, 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 nominal, war the nominal thing is like control but that's and even that, then, that's super vague. Their actual motivations are so vague, barely discussed. Exactly. It doesn't, like, the logistics of how they plan on, like, operating themselves don't matter as much as who is their target. When they say we want to rule the galaxy and we want order, like, okay, who are the actual people that your problem is with and why? And that's a fundamental issue that starts with George Lucas. Mm -hmm. Not not even JJ or Ryan or Kathleen Kennedy. That's a that's a George Lucas issue from the very inception of this franchise. What are they fighting a war over? Which I mean, in fairness to George Lucas, for one like sort of B movie inspired sci fi kids adventure thing that you didn't even know would catch on. I mean, like, I, I don't didn't know what it was for the first movie, and I'm not saying that's an issue. But yeah, but once eventually, you're getting sequels and you make Empire Strikes Back, you need to start thinking about that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty clear that he never really did. Clone Wars goes into some, like, they have people actually question, what are we even fighting this war for? And we don't give a definitive answer because JJ, not JJ, I keep saying JJ. Lucas never even came up with one himself for yeah. what the initial war was over. And so Palpatine's like, you kill me, and then I will take over your body. Rey gives Ben her lightsaber and then pulls out another one. And then Palpatine's guards start trying to kill Rey. Why? What? As far as they know, she's going to do the thing that Palpatine wants her to do. Why did they start shooting at her? Uh, because I guess her like letting the, the lightsaber go was like, yeah, I'm not going to do it. But then she pulls out and of off to Kylo. I don't know. This this whole movie, and particularly this, this, third, this third act, is so convoluted and inconsistent and nonsensical and doesn't make any degree of sense from moment to moment. Okay, so now... He's like, and Jenny Nicholson on YouTube made a good point about this whole thing, where he's like, you're a dyad in the force, and now the two come together to restore the one true emperor, where it's like, the movie is literally screaming two completely unfounded and unset up, like, plot turns in quick succession, and is just expecting you to internalize that at all. It's like, the... the the two of them, they're a dyad in the force. They come together to restore the one true emperor. That, that's not anything that you've set up at all. Yeah, that's not like some prophecy that we set up. No. That's nonsense that he just spouts out of nowhere. And even if that is the idea, like, 
in the previous movie, their connection was set up because of Snoke. Like he says, Dyad, like it was some natural thing that just happened. You know. Like every once in a millennia, this Dyad has this connection in the Force and it makes them all powerful. And it's like, well, no, you just. That, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Or like, forget it not making any sense. It's just it's not what we had before. It's not, no. I mean, at this point, I care less about what, is what you're even doing. Like, does it make sense at all? Or is it even consistent with the nonsense that you've been spouting? And is what, you, is what you're trying to do in this scene consistent with what you were trying to do literally two minutes of screen time ago? No. Because he's like, kill me, and I'll inhabit your body. And then he's like, Oh no, change of plans. Let me just take both of your life force and I'll just have my old body back. And also, we're going to see in a second, this is ludicrous. He takes their life force and it restores his body. It also restores his clothes. He's going to have like some fresh threads in a second. Oh, I, that I didn't even notice. That's awful. <laughs> Uh, but again, I guess that's no worse than um, like Electro having <laughs> having a suit, even though he's just electricity. And I, I don't know. There's a I can I can let that go. Um, but I just it's, think it's one added layer of silliness on top of this not make this not working on any level at all. I mean, yeah, this movie is already nonsense. But hey, Moaning Myrtle's alive. <laughs> yep, so invested in that. Glad he's here. Along with uh um Poe's old flame who was barely in this movie. I just I don't understand our this movie's handling of Kylo Ren at all. I don't We're understand like, the movie's handling of literally any major plot point involving any major character. Yeah, no. But this especially well I say especially because the, there's nothing especially in this movie. Everything is just terrible. But this is weird. Of like this movie seems to understand that Kylo Ren is like, you know, an important character and a complex guy for parts of it. And then we get here and he doesn't speak a word except for Ow throughout this entire climax. He shows up and then they just toss him aside so that Palpatine and Ray can have the final confrontation. And it's like, did we just forget that Kylo Ren is as important a character as Rey? Well, it, the the hero has to take out the big bad guy by herself. And I guess we need him to come back so he can do his sacrifice so he can't have the same... He redeemed, I, quote unquote, redeemed, and we can have the stupid Ray Lo fangirl scene. But instead of... Make any sense. Like, he's been trying to kill her for half this movie, and then changes his mind for no real reason. And oh, then that was Kylo Ren trying to kill her. Wait, this is Ben Solo, who's a completely different guy. <laughs> like he's blown up multiple planets, tried to kill her, tried to kill her friends multiple times. Like there is no scenario where you can buy like if she has any sense of self worth that she kisses him. Yeah, no. It's again, it's the movie pretending that he has schizophrenia. Um, also, apparently, um, the Emperor does not need that fleet at all because he could just, just annihilate an entire fleet with lightning by himself. Yeah, and like, were Ray and Ben together that powerful that he like sucks up their energy and he's like, check out this epic bass drop? Come on. <laughs> There's a fan edit where just dubstep is playing as soon as he lights the <laughs> ship <laughs> <for> electricity. <laughs> and this is another uh, for the audience thing of like all these voices. These mean nothing to Ray. Yeah, Not she a never, no I one she did. Formerly a Jedi. Um, never even met any of them aside from Luke. Luke is the one single voice here that would mean anything to her. Everyone else, like, she has no reason to even be tangentially aware of their existence. 
I love it. So, well, we treat it like the Avatar thing almost, where it's like she talks to every Jedi that's died. Or like yeah. she has a link to every Jedi that's died. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like we just pulled right from Avatar out of nowhere. And like, see, this is a problem again with like when we get here. Um, so yeah, okay, I guess I firmly decided that I want to kill you and not take over your body. I guess having my not as old but still old body is enough for me. But the problem that we get to when he's like, I am all the Sith and Ray's uh, like, I'm all the Jedi. It's like the Sith versus Jedi conflict is not what these movies have been about. Yeah, they've, they're they not what this, this franchise, at least for the, these past three movies, has been about, which made it feel all the more like we were just ripping off Endgame. And mm -hmm. people have told me uh, they were shooting this movie along with that one. There's no way in heck they were ripping off that moment. To that I say, both of them are subsidiaries of Disney, and they do get to see the makings of each other's movies like in real time and do often get to see them early. So there's no doubt on my mind that JJ definitely got to see at least a cut of Endgame while, while he was making this. Although to be fair, on that note, I will say I Am Iron Man is a very last minute addition to Endgame. But even then, I think they definitely right. could have added it in the time between yeah. the game coming out and yeah, this definitely. Movie. Like what I'm what I'm saying is, even if they didn't like hear it during production, I would totally believe if they saw Endgame in theater and added something to that effect after that movie released in theaters, because that's a very quick like that's two lines across two shots, and like, that quickly was, became like the iconic line that people kept quoting along with. I love you 3000. Yeah, and like that that would not take a lot of time for them to reshoot no. or add into this movie. But again, and like this this is also part of my problem and I've been harping on the stormtrooper side of it, but really it's everything as far as this movie doesn't understand that the cycle has to stop and part of it is like Ray's like, "Oh, I'm all the Jedi." Well, I mean, in the last movie, we kind of reoriented that being a Jedi is about, like, you know, it's the actual sensical version of what Rose was saying. So, like, in that, in that like, move, Luke isn't destroying anything. He's saving what he loves. And, like, that's the crux of being a Jedi is not necessarily pacifism, but not just brute strength and brute force. No, let's just kill Palpatine by redirecting his lightning back at him. Rey doesn't win because being a Jedi made her the morally better person. She doesn't win because of any, like, aspect of her character. No, she just had more brute strength than Palpatine. And now she's dying, I guess? Yep, took a lot out of her. Holding, <laughs> holding some lightsabers just it took a lot out of her, Nick. I don't know what to tell you. It was even more draining than Luke projecting a whole physical <laughs> manifestation of himself across light years. I don't understand. I'm telling you, it was a lot harder for her to just hold two lightsabers together than it was for Leia to say one word across subspace. Or is like, is what I'm supposed to believe because I was going to like heal her and then he's going to disappear like Luke did. Am I supposed to believe that like Palpatine, Palpatine drained them of their energy and like one or both of them was going to die in a couple moments anyway and Rey hearing all the Jedi voices gives her like a second wind for like a couple of minutes? I don't know. I don't think the coordinators of the scene or the writers or JJ, I don't think any of them are even thinking that hard about it. They're just... Yeah, probably not. They're either making this up as they go along or they really thought like this was on this in the script, and they thought, "Oh, this is fine. This totally works." We've t we've been like we've been doing nothing but complaining about this scene while it's been going on, and I feel like we're still underselling it. The degree to which this barely feels written. Yeah, like I think there's a there's definitely a clear choice in not giving Kylo Ren any dialogue after his fight with um after his fight with Ray, and then talking to a hallucination of his dad. They know good and well that they can't really write 
any kind of redemption arc with him that works, like him explaining why he suddenly made this shift. So he just doesn't say anything. So much of his character and like his physicality and the way that he speaks has been predicated on he's a really messed up guy that they probably just don't know how to write him not messed up. I mean, this this is your character. You should know how to write him. Even if he goes through something that fundamentally changes the things that he wants and the things he decides to do, you should know how to write your character. Like, Tony Stark doesn't suddenly not feel like Tony Stark just because um, he's gone through some traumatic stuff and he makes a pretty, um, like, major morale shift in Civil War. Like, it's like, He's at a place now where he's a little less egotistical and wants to take responsibility for his actions because he's so guilt ridden. And uh, oh my god, I I don't want to again. I don't want to get into any kind of like gender discussion because regardless of what I think of this, has nothing very, to do with gender. This does not work. Period. Because of the stuff. No, but I just mean because of what I'm about to say, which okay. is that. Like, I saw this movie last night with three women, and all of them were fine with this. Of course they were. I I don't want it to be, like, a pejorative, of course they'd be fine with it because they're ladies thing. But I just, I don't, I can't wrap my head around it. I don't understand how you could find that satisfying or necessary. It I find it genuinely gross. It grosses me out. He spent half this movie trying to kill her. Like, how are you fine with that? Yeah, and like even when he's not trying to kill her in the Last Jedi, which is the movie that's like playing on their There's tension, tension between them. Yeah, across all three of these movies, even when he's not trying to kill her, he's like undermining her. He's like emotionally manipulating her. In a lot of ways, he's treating her like a tool for his own gain. Like there's nothing remotely healthy or romantic about their relationship. It's just not. He's like, he literally nails her. And that's that's not redemption. He, and like him turning and doing all of this stuff over the latter half of this movie does not make a lick of sense. And, and there even if- There really been hit Cloud City? <laughs> Also, I just noticed uh, after someone pointed out to me that the, the Ewoks there, they're looking at someone having pulled off a Holdo maneuver. If you look off in the distance uh, as it pans down in that earlier shot, it's ships that are like destroyed in exactly the same way as Holdo did. I would like to know why <laughs> and why we didn't actually see that happen on screen. I guess just because they've got Star Destroyers all over the place. And I, I don't know, because on the one hand, you'd think that with the earlier shot, we're establishing that it's like an Avengers thing where they take down the big antenna and everything just goes down, not just on Exegol, but all over the place. So why was that necessary? It wasn't. I guess we just want to, that's another one of the things that JJ um, decided to take from last movie that he thought was cool. Aesthetically, yeah. Yeah. It's funny. It's like, no. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Why did we open this movie with the big slug guy on the Falcon? I don't know. We have two lesbians kissing, and that's fine, I guess. Um, Which, you know, hey, instead of actually having a lesbian character be a three-dimensional character, I guess people will be satisfied if they have a quick kiss that we can easily edit out of theaters for China. Yep. <laughs> it's three I, seconds long. Um, if you're going to do it, like, I hate, you that, you guys. I hate it, that chewy thing. It, the, it's ridiculous. What What did he do to warrant that? I, I guess um, they felt bad because they thought he was dead and he turned out not to be. So it's like, here's a medal. You're not dead. It's ridiculous because, like, this isn't just 
like fan managing for complaints about the last Jedi or whatever. That's a really stupid complaint that people have had for 30 plus years. Yeah. It just it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. No. Chewie does not do it anything that warrants a medal versus anyone else in this movie. And it's like it's like everyone's like, well, why didn't Chewie get a medal at the end of A New Hope? I don't know. Maybe Chewie just doesn't care. Maybe he just doesn't like medals. There could be any number of reasons besides like taking five seconds out of this completely separate movie several decades later where Chewie doesn't help the final conflict at all and being like, here you go, Chewie. Here's your medal. I, ooh, it's so stupid. And yet, and yet, like, I, I'm so frustrated because I love this. Just yeah. the, the, the something that feels really grimy about them, like her embracing them right after she made out with Kylo Ren. But, yeah, um, despite everything, like the three of them hug and I do feel something. Yeah, that and feels I, real. Like you look at all the actors, like that feels so genuine. Yeah, it's like I almost want to be more mad at this movie that instead of hating everything about it, there are these tiny, like, little five to 30-second nuggets of, oh, that's nice, instead of just, ah, It's yeah. so frustrating because... It's not, it's not outright hateable like a lot of BVS is. Yeah, like, BVS, there's not, like... There's maybe two self-contained little nuggets of a moment in BVS where I'm like, oh, hey, that's neato, or hey, that's a nice character thing. Here they're like sprinkled in all over the place, but they're not nearly enough to make this a good movie, and that just makes me all the more frustrated. It's like they deserved a better movie, and those moments deserve to exist in a better film than this is. I think all these actors deserved a much better trilogy. Um, and I and I like, as we've discussed, I like Force Awakens okay. I think it's a fun movie. I remain ever so conflicted about Last Jedi, and this movie's bad. But I think what would have finally gotten me a Star Wars trilogy that I would, could have genuinely enjoyed, because like I said, even a real even a real original trilogy, it's not bad. Um, it's just that first movie's really boring, and the other two are just okay for me. Um, we could have helped we could have helped this trilogy a lot if we knew where we were going and we planned it out yeah and like i i maintain just to as we near the end to sort of like recap my thoughts that the force awakens and last jedi are both movies that i enjoy more each time i rewatch them the last jedi is one of my all-time favorite movies the Force Awakens, I think, is just a really, really solid, compelling adventure film. And this is just so, it's so bizarre to have those two movies and then come into this one where there's really no reason that it should be like this. And it's just so strange to me. If directors and filmmakers could live in a bubble and not be influenced by, what the fans want and you know reddit and so many toxic people screaming about how raise a mary sue and um S sjw culture is ruining star wars and all this other crap um i think this movie turns out a lot differently that and we don't get jj jj should not have directed this movie yeah because um, it was all he knew how to do was nostalgia anyway um and trying to placate people who didn't like last jedi on top of that was born to be a recipe for disaster yeah. I'd have liked to have seen JJ's like visual directing approach to a script by maybe Ryan or just anyone else competent because I I just nothing about the script works. Nothing. If if anything about the script comes close to working, it's self-contained little relationship beats that are just in a sea of points that don't make sense or time that is just wasted. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's really, it's really, really bad. But here's the question that I have just mm -hmm. sort of like 
bring the emotions down a little bit. Um, a complaint that a lot of people have with that last scene, aside from just Ray Skywalker being stupid and under Ray as a character, is there are some people who feel like that scene is implying she's going to stay on Tatooine? And I don't get that implication at all. Did that ever occur to you? Not remotely. Um, I thought that it would mean she would just try to, you know, continue to, you know, maybe uh, go off with the... I mean, she's not with them in that scene, obviously, but um, leave and go off with uh, Finn and Poe and just try to keep the peace around the galaxy. That's Yeah, and like, if that's the case, like, putting aside that I hate Ray Skywalker, I would have ended the movie at that hug. Like, pan out from that hug and then cut to credits. But no, we've got to come back and do some more nostalgia worship. Of yeah, we, we got to pretend like this sequel trilogy was all about the Skywalkers in the first place. Not just that, we have to pretend that uh, Tatooine as a location is meaningful to the characters more than it is just the fans. Like, Tatooine didn't mean anything to Leia. It's a place that Luke desperately wanted to get away from. None of the other characters have been there, hardly. But, you know, fan service. Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll say this much. I don't know if it's and just JJ knows how to do cool flashy lights, but I'm going to assume it's because you were here with me on this one. This was thankfully not a slog. I was glad that we were able to pull each other through this together because this movie thankfully didn't feel like a million years. <laughs> well, see, that that's the interesting thing. And I, I told you this even when I was coming out of the theater the first time. The pacing's not really an issue. Um, the movie never really feels too slow or mind-numbingly boring. Um, but just on paper, as a story, the plot is just a mess. Um, but like, you know, it's decently, it's decently paced. There's, there's some, uh, some fairly fine action to watch and um, some great character moments. But it's just, like you said, it's just drenched in a sea of really bad writing. <laughs> Yeah, it's like if you, if you look to this movie for any kind of meaning, then you're playing yourself. If you look to this movie as just a complete, like, turn off your guard, that, that turn off your brain, like, trash, generic action movie, then, yeah, you should be fine. But if you're someone who, like, especially coming off of Last Jedi and, like, say what you want about that movie and, like, execution... That was a movie with things to say. And like following it up with this is such a letdown. Um, it is. And I, I do want to say that um, I, I'm definitely not the prototypical Star Wars fan. Um, I love Clone Wars. And, and most recently, well, Clone Wars literally just had its final uh, season in. But, um, and the other thing is Fallen Order. That game is great. I really like the story. I am going to eventually do my own video on it. But, um, and I mean, the story is, like I said, fairly similar to this. It is a MacGuffin, we got to go get something plot. Um, but the difference is they do the legwork to make me invested in characters. And the plot and motivations of villains isn't completely inconsistent and nonsensical scene to scene. And there are really no fake outs. Um, oh, that's not entirely true. There's one fake out with a character. I'm not going to say who. There's a fake out where uh, it looks like a certain character killed her and then she comes back. But um, other than that, there's uh, there's nothing that I would say is really um, all that bothersome from a story perspective. It is fairly straightforward when, you know, you got to, it's an adventure thing. You got to go find, um, the, you know, the MacGuffin. But I'm invested in characters. They have arcs. They have um, flaws that are um, constantly um, making it harder for them to achieve their goals over the course of the story. Um, they do eventually come over them for the most part. But you know, they have they have interesting character flaws, and um, they're endearing at the same time. And it's just like I said, they they did the legwork to make me care about that story versus this. Yeah. Like, the worst part is, like, this was a continuation of a story that I did care about, and 
they just drop the ball so hard. And you know what's crazy? Um, Fallen Order is a story that is pretty inconsequential to the larger Star Wars canon, um, as most prequels would kind of have to be because you can't do anything drastic because it would, you know, kind of contradict what's already happening and come after you. So um, it doesn't have like large sweeping implications, but the story is pretty, when you break it down to that, it actually is pretty personal. And some people would view the ending as that, that climatic. The ending is one of the things I like the most about it because, um, I mean, yeah, we talk about how, you know, subversion for subversion's sake is kind of annoying at this point. It's um, it's a complete lob at you know Last Jedi and a lot of other things, but with that game, it was uh, I don't want to sit here and st- start talking about something else and not the movie. But the point that I'm making is I'm still interested in parts of this franchise. Um, I don't suddenly hate Star Wars just because I don't like this movie. Um, and uh, I will say, if you are a Star Wars fan, there's there's tons of other media out there for you to enjoy, like. I am going to get into the books. I just started reading um, Ahsoka's book. Um, well, reading it in tandem with uh, the audio book. Um, and I am going to read Thrawn Trilogy because a bunch of Star Wars fans are recommending that to me. So I'm finally going to read that mm-hmm. at some point. But yeah, there, there's other parts of this franchise to to jump on on board with if you're not into, this, into these movies and think that they're, uh, I don't know, um, blasphemous or whatever yeah i don't know i'm i'm definitely going to at least jump into clone wars once i carve out enough time but like i'm i'm more of a movie person than i am any of those other things so it'll probably be just clone wars and uh whatever else comes to disney plus but i don't know there's there's a level of like, like the, I, I don't want to keep repeating myself, but the degree to which my disappointment with this movie just comes from Last Jedi is what made me care about these movies. And then I got a couple of years of that, and then this one makes it so I regret caring. And worse than being bad, worse than being like just generically poorly written, I think the worst that piece of art can make you feel is regret for having cared about something. That's fair. Um, but yeah, that was our commentary on the sequel trilogy. Yeah, on the back positive note. <laughs> I, I do. I would like to do more commentaries. I was thinking um, Batman. I, I, I believe some people were suggesting we do Batman right after we did the Spider-Man movies. Hmm. Well, I mean, if people are down to hear me complain some more in similar ways to which I've done with this movie, then, uh, yeah, the the first couple of Batman movies will definitely bring that out of me, so I have no objections. Um, I have a question for you, because I know there are different cuts of of 89. Um, I'm going to go with the theatrical, I think. I'm not going to try to do... Yeah, that sounds appropriate. But um, I was, see, because for those, I don't even know how much I'd have to say. I was kind of thinking we just do Nolan Trilogy. Hmm. We'll tell you what. Well, let's both rewatch those movies, and we'll see if we have that much to say about them. And if not, we'll just stick with the Nolan movies. Okay, cool. Because I, I have plenty to say about Nolan. Um, I'm so apathetic about, um, was it the 1989? Yeah. Um, first movie yeah I, I don't i barely have anything to say about that movie like i'm real um, torn on 1989 and i flat out hate returns it's it's not great it's i mean as a kid i was like some parts of this are campy and kind of enjoyable um but if you go back to that at all liking batman at all it's like yeah he's not a killer and he definitely wouldn't smile after strapping a bomb to someone and then kicking them down a, a sewer grate or a yeah, that was that was really that was something. I don't know who that character was, but it wasn't Batman. Yeah. Um, so that said, uh, the good people who have been listening to us, thank you so much. Uh, let us know how you feel about this movie or any of our comments in the comments. 
And uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Look forward to more commentaries and also more scripted stuff coming down the pipeline eventually. Uh, if you haven't already, like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, thanks very much for making it this far. I would say May the 4th be with you, but that was two days ago. Yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, generically, may the force be with you. You'll probably need it if you sat through this movie. Especially with us complaining about it the entire time. <laughs> yeah, so that said, peace out. <laughs>